today's um, keynote speaker, invited speaker, which is Ursula Kummer. Um, Ursula and I have been collaborating for a very long time, um, I think since 1999. Um, and uh, our main collaboration is actually one of the topics of this uh, workshop, which is COPAS itself. So Ursula's group works on COPAS, just like my group and Stefan Hoops' group um, on the software. So, so they're actively um, contributors to the code as well as, as ourselves. And, um, but of course, uh, she doesn't just, um, her group, um, in fact, like both of ours as well, is not just involved in building the software, they also use the software. And I think uh, today, Ursula is going to uh, tell us about um, applying Copasi to a very interesting problem. And when this talk will be a little different from the previous, it's going to be applied to um, microbes, I believe. So um, we're very glad to have uh, Ursula coming here and uh, giving us, um, presenting her, her work, um, modeling work. So Ursula, go ahead and uh, thanks very much. Hi, everybody. And thanks, Pedro, for the nice introduction. Yes, indeed, it has been a long standing collaboration. And today, so let me share my screen. Um, during the talk, in order to really focus on what I'm going to say, I will uh, just turn off my video. And um, it's my pleasure to uh, discuss a project with you that we have been developing over the last few years, uh, where we actually modeled the pH-dependent lactose metabolism of um, a microbe, Lactobacillus del Broquet, um, which is a key species of yogurt production, as you will see. And we used throughout the project Kopasi. That's why I thought it's a fitting project for uh, this workshop. So um, lactic acid bacteria are a group of gram-positive bacteria, which include on one side uh, pathogens um, and also commensals like Enterococcus fecalis, but also they are heavily used in biotechnology. So for example, as you all might know, Lactococcus lactis, or in this case, Lactobacillus uh, vulgaricus, or also Streptococcus thermophilus. Um, the latter two are involved in yogurt production and Lactococcus lactis, for example, in cheese production. Actually, all of these are closely related to each other. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, and I mean, one reason why they are named so differently is actually that, that uh, clients of consumers of, um, of food simply at some time in, uh, didn't want to um, buy something where streptococci are in the food. But originally, actually, most of them were called streptococci because they are so closely related. Now, in order to sort of optimize yogurt production, of course, the metabolism of the species is central. And that's why in a, a big consortium, which also involved um, a company from Denmark, which is producing starter cultures for yogurt production, we actually set out to understand uh, some of the metabolic uh, traits of uh, Lactobacillus bulgaricus um, better. So <clears throat> it's all about yogurt production. So what is important to know is that in that case, of course, you have sort of batch cultures. I mean, it's not a, a biotechnological reactor where you have a constant influx and outflux. And these cultures acidify in the course of time. I mean, you all know that, I mean, yogurt, for example, is preserved or uh, actually um, doesn't expire so readily because it's acidic. And the same holds with kefir and other uh, dairy products. So this acidification is really important. And the responsible factors for that are, of course, these lactic acid bacteria. So now, what kind of modeling approach would you take in order to um, answer such a question, in order to uh, understand how the metabolism of these bacteria during acidification work? And 
if you look at uh, the models in biomodels, some couple of years back, I mean, what you could see is that the vast majority, of course, is um, ODE models. There are a few logical models, and then, I mean, these so-called constraint-based models, and very few patronet models. So what's the approach that we um, decided to take? Well, I mean, during the acidification, of course, the dynamics is very important. And I mean, you wouldn't understand such a dynamical process if you simply look at flux distributions like in constraint-based models or genome scale models. So in this case, the choice is easy. I mean, it has to be kinetic models. And um, as we, I will also mention later, you can use genome scale models to answer certain questions in relation with this lactic acid bacteria, but certainly not understand in detail how the metabolism actually works under these conditions of acidification. And since we decided to do it with kinetic models, of course, <laughs> being involved in the project myself, uh, we used COPASI for that. Now let me introduce I mean, um, Tamara, uh, who has been the student mo doing most of the work on the computational side. Actually, it's not the lactic acid bacteria sitting there, <laughs> it's Endococcus fecalis, but I mean, nevertheless, she worked with yogurt bacteria. And what she actually did is uh, that she uh, built a model of the uh, central metabolism and the lactose metabolism in this organism. And she included, as you will see, protons as free variables in all relevant reactions, something that is surprisingly um, rarely done, actually. Um, and even more important, she uh, included the pH dependency of all the enzyme activities. And you will see how she did that, because that's not trivial at all. In addition, since we are dealing with uh, um, batch culture, she had to take care of uh, growing total cellular volume. So the volume will change over the course of uh, the simulation. So the first step is that actually um, she measured experimentally as a first step uh, the pH dependency of the activity of the enzymes in uh, cell extracts of Lactobacillus bulgaricus. For that, she actually went to Amsterdam and uh, did this work in the lab of Bas Toysing, who has been a collaborator on this project. So <clears throat> for basically the all of the enzymes where the rates are not exceedingly fast. I mean, the ones, the isomerases and mutases were uh, not all of them were measured, but most of the others and including some of the isomerase mutases where either the pH profile for the species could be found in the literature or it was measured by uh, Tamara herself in, in these cases. And then what she did is that she used uh, COPASI to fit a factor for the activity of each of the enzymes, which follows a bell-shaped uh, pH curve. So in a divide and conquer strategy, so now we are not talking yet about the, the fitting of the individual uh, kinetic parameters, but simply the um, you could normalize it for that uh, um, sake. Um, so, but initially she just fitted the pH dependencies based on these experimental measurements so that she basically had this factor fitted for all of the enzymes. So then she also included protons in the stoichiometries of all the uh, reactions that actually involve protons. And that's, of course, uh, quite a number, because each time ATP hydrolysis, for example, is involved, uh, you also have um, the uh, liberation of a proton. You have transporters that support protons. Um, you have all kinds of reactions where protons are involved. And in all of these cases, 
Now protons are handled as a free variable and you do, don't assume anymore that you have a very well buffered uh, cytosolic situation. So both in the medium, so outside of, of these bacteria, as well as within the cell, you now have protons in the stoichiometry of each reaction. So it's fully proton dependent. So, I mean, that's of course easily done if you use, for example, COPASI, because you can in each of the processes then specify protons as free variables and then actually uh, define the corresponding kinetics. So um, I just want to uh, already point out that, I mean, there are certain reactions here which we call anti-dilution. And you will see in a, in a second that these are really important to keep in mind. In total, this um, model in the end, that's just one part of it, uh, contains 48 reactions or processes. And the protons, as I said, are part of all relevant um, reactions. So I told you it's a batch culture. So the volume, the cytosolic volume changes. Now what Tamara did is that she actually not only measured um, optical density as a measure of, of cytosolic volume, but she actually uh, used machine learning um, to use microscopic pictures and there actually determine the cellular volume by um, image decomposition. And then since these bacteria have a rod-like um, function, she uh, rod-like shape, she could actually um, estimate the uh, cellular volume in quite a high precision. So just assuming it's a cylinder basically. And, and from the images, then she got the cytosolic volume. And to that now in another basically independent fit, the we, fitted a volume function to, to this curve that was that she measured basically experimentally. And this heuristic fitted uh, volume change was then used to describe the cytosolic volume change uh, during uh, the simulation, during the fit of the experimental data. And once again, why is then this, a set of reactions important? Well, you have to basically increase the moieties in your system where you don't have an influx and an outflux that would take care um, if you do it properly of the volume change or is taken care of um, by the software. Uh, the moieties have to increase because if you basically double the cellular volume, you don't want to have a decrease of uh, the concentration of these moieties. You assume basically that um, uh, things are kept constant with respect to ATP, ADP, NADPH, uh, stuff like that. So you have to include a function that basically as, as the name implied, um, uh, prohibits that you have a dilution of the concentrations. You want to keep them constant, so they have to increase exactly with the same um, uh, factor as the volume increases in this uh, model. So before I show you then the uh, fit of the total um, uh, model to experimental data, I want to um, spare a few words about scaling the transport processing. So it's a digression, digression and I, I will use an extreme example just to make you understand why it's important also to look at that uh, also in a software like Kupasi. So the problem is how do you scale membrane processes? So meaning reactions that um, are in between compartments. If you look into the literature um, and assume that you simply have a reaction as uh, reacts to P, 
you quite commonly will find that uh, the concentrations of such a system, if S and P are in different compartments, will be described like that. Okay. So, I mean, simple mass action kinetics, and then you have sort of a ratio between the volumes as a factor in this kinetics. And really, if you just look at the literature, you find it a lot. And it's also often in, in certain software um, that you find in the uh, community, it's, it's what the software assumes. Now, let's assume that you reuse the system and you change one or both of the volumes then in that case, the reaction rate, of course, will be scaled with these volumes. And, and that's intrinsically not correct, because if you think about it, a transport process, as we will see in a second, will usually, if at all, scale with the area um, over which this process um, takes place. Uh, place. I mean, the, for the transport process, I mean, here it could be the cell surface um, in principle. Now, how can you prevent that you do something intrinsically wrong by, I mean, uh, forming the product of your reaction kinetics with the volume ratio? And is that a problem at all? Well, we tried one extreme case a couple of years ago where we actually dealt with a, a plant system which describes root elongation growth. So that's basically the root of a plant of Arabidopsis uh, thaliana. And uh, within the elongation zone, uh, the cells are elongated, as the name implies. And there is transport along longitudinal, the longitudinal axis, which means that the area between the two cells here, even if there is growth, is not changing at all. So since the area actually allows for the transport in between these two cells, I mean, there will be no change whatsoever in the process rate um, if you have a process, um, a diffusion, for example, between these two cells. So you have to make sure that there is by no way a scaling with the volume because that would be entirely wrong. And what we tried out is to scale the system at different zones here, either correctly with the area, which gives you these concentration profiles for just an, a simple uh, diffusion reaction, or uh, to have it in a single volume, which obviously runs in, in the, uh, to a homogeneous distribution along uh, this route, or to scale it actually with the volume as I have uh, showed you above, um, which would be wrong. And you can see that here, the difference between these profiles is really tremendous. So here you would really do something terribly wrong if you would uh, uh, proceed in the, in the, let's call it usual way um, by uh, multiplying with this volume ratio. So that underlines that it's better to really think about it actively, how you would scale such a transport process. So in, in many cases, it should be the area rather than a volume uh, ratio that scales basically uh, such a transport process. However, in principle, the software can't know beforehand uh, what would be the correct scaling. And that's why some years ago, the core SBML community, after also a lot of discussions with Janne Hofmeier, who published also a paper about that, um, decided that transport processes in principle should be assumed to be particles per time rather than concentration per time. And that's also what happens in COPASI. Um, you can tell the software to scale with the volume if appropriate, uh, or differently, you can also basically uh, define uh, that um, your rate constant is a global quantity and then define how that should scale with any uh, uh, volume increase. If there is a growth, if it scales with the resulting area, if it scales not at all, what, whatever. But you have to be aware that you have to do that actively. So the software as such, as we will see here, 
That's, for example, a, a transport process of lactate across the cell membrane in this Bulgaricus model. And if you look at the ODEs, where usually in Coparsi things are multiplied with the volume in order to result in particle numbers, uh, there is not, no such scaling here for that process. So you have to take care of the scaling when it comes to rate constants with uh, uh, compart different compartments. Okay, back to Bulgaricus. So with the resulting model that contained growing volume, um, enzyme activities which depend on pH, plus um, the protons in the stoichiometry, we actually fitted experimental data using Coparsi and then did some more sophisticated plots here. So basically, you see the experimental data points uh, that have been measured in batch culture uh, for different species like lactose and lactate and glucose and galactose. And that's the external pH actually in the medium. You can see the acidification. We fitted the uh, model on that. And as an Example, uh, you can see here the resulting simulation. We look at the identifiability of the parameters. Uh, and I mean, um, the easiest to do that is, of course, to, uh, and in this case, actually, the most realistic, because that fit is not easy, uh, is to repeat it many times and then see the spread of the parameters. And we also with that, uh, during that analysis, prepared um, model ensembles, which means it's the same good objective function, uh, but different parametrization, wherever you can't uh, really nail down individual parameters due to the fitting process or because you have measured them previously. And obviously, I mean, with 48 reactions and roughly a hundred parameters, even though there are quite a few measured, you will still have um, parameters that are not identifiable by the uh, available data. However, that's not such a big problem if you know about it and if you live with that fuzziness and if you basically have a set of uh, uh, these different parametrizations and you do your predictions and validation with all of them to see if the fact that you might not have identified, let's say, the Vmax for some fast reaction, um, if that's crucial or not. So <clears throat> in this case, we first of all used some experimental data that were not used for fitting with different initial lactose concentrations. And you can again see uh, the experimental data and the simulations color coded for the different conditions. And you can see once again, that's not a fit, it's a prediction that this actually worked uh, quite nicely. And you can, of course, then repeat that with your whole model ensemble. And in this case, you would see that they nicely overlay each other. Mm. We did some additional tests. Uh, so uh, we had uh, some endpoint uh, concentrations of um, pH and lactose and lactate. And uh, this gray point, for example, is with slightly different experimental conditions where uh, the casein in the, in the culture varied, which provides for some amino acids. But even then you can see that uh, basically the prediction is not so bad. This is very important for the um, for the biotechnological companies because um, the acidification is part also of the texture and of the flavor and of course of the preservation. Uh, so it's important to be able to predict to which end pH. Uh, the culture is tending, and also how much of the lactose is metabolized and how much lactate is produced, as well as some flavor compounds. What I really, really liked about the project is that you can see why at some point in time, the whole um, procedure comes to an end. And that's when actually the pH becomes too acidic 
even for the lactic acid bacteria. The lactic acid bacteria use that strategy to acidify their environment because they can outcompete most other bacteria. They can survive very low pHs, but at some point in time, due to the, and actually really due to the um, enzyme activities, which are pH dependent, as you can see here, the uh, flux of the uh, PYK, which is in our case uh, now a measure for the glycolytic flux, comes to a halt when the pH drops too much. And, and, and then the whole system, basically, even the lactic acid bacteria can't metabolize any further any lactose. That's why also the lactose here, if you start with a high concentration, some point in time, um, even they run into the problem that the acidification is uh, too strong. So I want to wrap up here to leave some room for questions. Um, taking the protons and pH dependencies into account allows us to understand the metabolism of these um, species in detail, in mechanistic detail during acidification. You can also see that the maintenance of the intracellular pH during this acidification process is absolutely decisive for the survival of the bacteria as long as possible. Um, because if they can't uh, maintain a relatively higher intracellular pH, uh, then they can't maintain glycolytic, glycolytic flux due to the uh, enzyme activity dependence. And therefore they have a very high energy demand in order to pump out protons from the intracellular volume. And that drives the metabolic adjustment. And that's actually this latter point, this energy demand is something that you can even spot um, using uh, genome scale models, uh, so uh, constraint-based models, where you can actually see that um, the um, pumping activity or the flux of the proton uh, pump uh, will then be instrumental for the survival of these bacteria and determines everything else. I mean, these bacteria take up uh, amino acids, not so much for biosynthesis, but really to metabolize them in addition to all the sugars that they can take up. And the, by the lot, this is only done in order to power the proton pumps and maintain an intracellular pH that still allows them to um, have glycolytic flux going on. I want to close by acknowledging some people. I mean, it has been Tamara mostly in my group, uh, together with her postdoc, uh, Sofia Figueredo. Um, also the students Ruth and Pascal, Frank and Sven are always incremental for, um, and crucial for uh, Kupasi. Um, it's a collaboration with the Toysing group in Amsterdam and the Tarkos group in Stuttgart. It also run bioreactors. The company involved is Christian Hansen in Denmark. And of course, last but not least, the Kopasi team as such. Um, and uh, so the whole project was powered by Kopasi. So thanks a lot for all uh, the collaborations on that part. And I would like to thank you for your attention and 